Um, I think maybe I need to apologize, first of all, um, because there may be a bit of overlap uh, between this talk and the previous one. But at least I identified one important difference, is, and that is that the view from my office is not by far as nice as that of the previous author, so I didn't bring a picture of that. I have no disclosures. So I'm sure you're all aware that the risk of recurrence, when you're studying risk of recurrence of venous thrombosis, is very different from that of a first event. So first of all, the risk is much higher. It's about 50-fold higher compared to the risk of a first event. So there is so much to be gained there in preventing this high number. And prevention can be done either, obviously, by reducing exposure to risk factors or when this is not possible by giving prophylaxis, and that's what Dr. Agenu just addressed. And yes, as he said, because the bleeding risk will often outweigh the thrombotic risk, so then in that case it doesn't make much sense to, to give trauma prophylaxis, it's necessary to identify low and high risk groups. And so another remarkable difference between recurrent and first events is that the risk profile is so different. And that's why we see these strange paradoxes that I will talk about. So in this talk, I would like to focus on that the ultimate goal is prevention of recurrence and the identification of high risk groups. And that is possible, obviously, by using data from studies, but it's also important, I think, to have a sort of a conceptual framework to think about individual risk and risk profiles. And for that, I think we need to realize that obviously venous thrombosis is one disease, but the risk profile can differ extremely between individuals. Like a pulmonary embolism in a young woman who just gave birth is completely different from that in a 75-year-old man who has pancreatic cancer. And another thing that is important to do here is to distinguish different types of risk factors because the type of risk factor is related to recurrence risk, and I'll, I'll show you that in the next slides. So in that way, we can perhaps begin to understand why the risk profile of recurrence is so different from that of a first, and also to understand these recurrence paradoxes. And we'll use the thrombosis potential model as a tool for that. The first paradox, I'm sure you're all aware of this, is the famous thrombophilia paradox. As you all know, uh, thrombophilia increases the risk of a first event quite substantially, with relative risks between 2 and 7, depending on the, on the factor we're looking at. But for recurrence, the effect is only marginally increased with relative risks just above one, basically. The other paradox is age, and I'm sure you're aware of this as well, but age is more or less the most important risk factor for a first event, which is shown in the, in the picture on the left. These are data from Norway region population, and you can see that the risk increases almost exponentially with age. In strong contrast to that is the picture on the right that shows the risk of recurrence related to age, and here you see hardly any difference between these three age groups. And that is also something we recently found in a MEGA study. This is a large study where we started with 4,700 patients with a first event who were followed for recurrence. About 670 patients developed one. And here the, the risks are depicted by age group and by sex. And you can see that the incidence rates fluctuate, but there's clearly not a trend to be discerned, and there's certainly not a clear increase of risk with age. And then the third paradox, that goes sort of the other way around. So whereas the, the first two clearly had an effect on first event, but no effect on recurrence, for sex it's more or less the other way around, because again in this picture by Inger Ananas from Norway, you can see that the risks for men and women also differ a little bit, but they're not extremely different. But when we look at recurrence, the risk is much higher in men as compared to women. It was first described by Curley in New England Journal of Medicine and has been confirmed in a large meta-analysis where the combined relative risk is about 1.6 for men versus women. Now, you may be confused already, but it could be a bit of a comfort to know that you find these funny recurrence paradoxes also for other conditions. So it has to do a bit with studying recurrence rather than first events. And that is, for example, the case for myocardial infarction, where people find that smoking protects against the second MI, that aspirin increases the risk of a second MI, and that 
also obesity protects against second MI. And the same has been found for stroke. This is actually also called the obesity paradox. Many papers have been written about that. Obesity seems to protect against a second stroke. Now, to understand all this, we will first, I would like to go through the next slides by showing you, first of all, the etiology of a first event, and then discuss the different types of risk factors. And I'll do that by using this thrombosis potential model. This is a model that was first developed by Fritz Rosendahl in 1999, and it shows the, on the y-axis, the thrombosis potential of one individual. And that means kind of the, the cumulative likelihood that a person will develop a thrombotic event at a certain point in time. And on the x-axis, the time is depicted. So in this case, a person is exposed only to age, and as age becomes a stronger risk factor over time, his thrombosis potential goes gradually up by time. Now, if this person also happens to have factor V Leiden, that will add to his thrombosis potential, obviously. And the red line shows the combined thrombosis potential for this person at different points in time. And now when this, in this case it's a she, she starts using oral contraceptives for a certain period and you can imagine that that adds again to her thrombosis potential, so it goes up during this period. And now at some point she goes skiing and she fractures her leg and she needs a plaster cast and obviously in that period her thrombosis risk increases quite strongly. So here we see that she accumulates so many risk factors, so her thrombosis potential becomes that high that it crosses the so-called thrombosis threshold, and at that point she develops a thrombotic event. And obviously many people will say here that the cause of her first event was the plaster cast, but you can see in this model that is not really true. She had actually four causes that contributed to this event at this point in time. So, for example, if she had not had factor V Leiden, she would not have developed a thrombosis after this plaster cast. So that's how I think etiology works in an individual. And it's important to understand this to understand recurrence risk as well. And now I'd like to discuss the different types of risk factors. So first of all, the transient ones, which has also been mentioned by Dr. Ageno. This is almost a classical picture, I would say, by Trevor Backlin, where he found that people who had had surgery afterwards had a very low risk of recurrence, actually. The line is flat here. Whereas people who did not have any transient risk, risk factors at the time of their event have a very high risk. Here, the idiopathic curve is extremely high. And in between, we see the group who also were exposed to transient risk factors, but these were different ones. They were non-surgical. They were things like hospitalization and prolonged immobilization. So this group is sort of in between the two others. And this was nicely confirmed by Yorio in meta-analysis of 11 studies into the incidence of recurrence, and he shows exactly the same picture. So people who did not have a transient risk factor had almost tenfold increased risk compared to patients who had surgery just before their first event. And when we look at the thrombosis potential model, this can be understood. Because as surgery is such a strong risk factor, the thrombosis potential increases so much when a person has had surgery. But then when that period is over, it goes down again considerably as well. So that means that her, the thrombosis potential of this person drops substantially. And it will take a very long time until this person develops again a recurrence when this person crosses the thrombosis threshold again. And depending on the strength of that risk factor, the thrombosis potential will drop more or less. So, for example, a woman who is 50 and used HRT, hormonal replacement therapy, as this is a less strong risk factor, her thrombosis potential will go, go down less strongly. So she stays closer to this thrombosis threshold and therefore her recurrence risk is higher. She is more likely to develop a recurrence sooner. And the other, the third group are the idiopathic ones. And here's a person who is 50, who was only actually exposed to, to age and to quite a large amount of genetic defects. And this combination leads him to cross the thrombotic threshold here. 
And you can imagine that because these risk factors are fixed, they cannot go down. And it's very difficult for him to lower his thrombosis potential and therefore he will stay for the future at the same level of risk and his risk will remain high. So my first conclusion is that recurrence risk is low when a transient risk factor was present at the first event and the reduction in risk is related to the strength of this risk factor. Now then to the fixed risk factors that I just discussed already. So this is the same picture actually here. You can compare this picture to this one where the red line is the same, but the underlying risk factors are different. This is a person who's much older and therefore he starts at a higher risk. His, his thrombosis potential is high because of his age. And he does not have that many genetic defects as the previous person, but he still follows the same line. He still crosses the thrombosis threshold at a certain point. And for him also, it's very difficult to lower his thrombosis potential and therefore his future recurrence risk will stay increased. And actually, these two people have exactly the same recurrence risk because they cannot go down in risk. And therefore, whenever you would compare any exposure between these two people, such as age or such as thrombophilia, you will not find any effect of these exposures on risk because there is no risk difference. And that actually explains these paradoxes of both the age and the thrombophilia paradox, you will not find any effect of fixed risk factors on recurrence risk. So my second conclusion is once the thrombotic threshold is reached, fixed risk factors do not play a role anymore in predicting subsequent recurrence risk. And it's important, however, to realize that although these factors do not predict, they are still causes of recurrence, obviously. If we would have an anti-factor 5 Leiden pill, he would go down in thrombotic potential and his risk would be reduced. So that would look like this, that this is his current situation. And then we treat him with an anti-factor 5 Leiden pill. And you see that he, from that moment on, his genetic risk will go down and therefore also his thrombosis potential will go down and it will take much longer for him to develop a recurrence. So these factors are causes, but are, do not predict recurrence. Then a third group that is, I think, so the, the transient ones, when once they've passed, the recurrence risk decreases. For the fixed group, the recurrence risk stays more or less the same. And I think for this progressive group, the risk will go up. And by progressive risk factors, I mean comorbidity, diseases that become more severe over time. So that is the case in patients who have cancer, which is progressive, which becomes worse over time. You get a person gets more treatments and so on. So this person's thrombotic potential goes up as soon as he has cancer. It will not go down. In fact, it will probably become higher and therefore his recurrence risk or her recurrence risk will become higher. And that's what you see in studies, that people with cancer have a much higher recurrence risk than people without. And a similar picture was found for inflammatory bowel disease, which is probably the same situation, I think, as in cancer. Also here, these patients have a higher recurrence risk. For BMI, I was a little bit in doubt if I should classify that under the fixed risk factors or under the progressive ones, but unfortunately, BMI tends to become higher quite quickly over time. So, and that's what you see here in this picture, people with higher BMI do indeed have higher recurrence risk. So the third conclusion is that patients in whom a risk factor is progressive in strength, this group has an increased recurrence risk and it has not so very well been studied for all of these conditions, but it seems logical to say that this is the case. Now, another important group, I think, are the, is exposure to new transient risk factors. So that would be the case if a person has had a first event and subsequently starts again with using hormones or becomes pregnant or has surgery, etc. And again, you can understand that with the model. So here we have our woman of 35 who had surgery. She has in principle a low thrombosis potential. It will take very long for her to develop a recurrence. 
unless she starts taking, for example, hormonal replacement therapy at a certain point in time, she will increase her thrombosis potential and develop recurrent event much sooner. There are not many studies who have looked into effects of, of these kinds of exposures. These are data from the LED study, which was quite small. There were only 90 recurrent events. But still, it was clear from this study that the risk of recurrence was very much increased when a person was again exposed to such a transient risk factor. And here are some data from the MEGA study again. So that was the one I just mentioned. Bernadine Stegeman, together with Jasmine Tim, have looked at these data in premenopausal women in the MEGA study. This has been presented yesterday. You can still find the abstracts, hopefully. And she found that in about 3,000 people, premenopausal women, who stopped their hormonal use at the time of their first event, their recurrence risk was low. It was just 11 per thousand per year. However, there was quite a considerable group, actually, of about 500 people, women, who continued or restarted hormonal contraceptive use. And in this group, the risk was threefold increased, actually. So that is obviously a shame. These events could clearly have been prevented. So the fourth conclusion is that exposure to risk factors after first event should be avoided. And when this is not possible, trauma prophylaxis is warranted during exposure to these risk factors. And then lastly, I'd like to discuss the category of markers. These have also already been mentioned by Dr. Aigeno, and I think these are not so much perhaps causes of recurrence, but more they show that there's something going on. There's a thrombogenic process, there's a procoagulant state present, and that probably predicts very well, and that, that is indeed also the case, as, as found in several studies. So D-dimer levels are a clear example. Obviously, they are clearly related to, to higher or lower recurrence risk. Also, Dr. Curley found that high factor 8 levels are related to recurrence risk as thrombin generation. And for residual thrombus, there are also some data, although this does not appear to predict that strongly with the relative risk here of 1.5 in a meta-analysis, but it could still perhaps be useful in combination with other markers. And then again, here is the slide study by Trevor Backlin, who shows that the location is, is important for recurrence risk, and people with a distal thrombosis have a much lower risk of recurrence. So apparently markers of a thrombogenic process are not really true causes, but they are still good predictors of recurrence. So I talked to you about these two paradoxes, age and thrombophilia, but I have not yet discussed sex. Here, this paradox is, goes the other way around, as I said before. For a first event, the risk for men and women is about equal. And for recurrent events, the risk in men is, is about doubled. And Rachel Roach has written a nice paper on this problem. And she presented that this morning. Again, I hope you can find the abstract if you're interested. And her hypothesis is that, in fact, for a first event, the same is true. So men also have twice as high recurrent risk of a first event than compared to women, except that we don't see it because women are obviously exposed to so many extra risk factors such as pregnancy and hormone use. So she thought that if we could do an analysis and, and disregard the use of a reproductive use of hormones and pregnancy and so on, we could perhaps find indeed this, this risk difference. And she did that again in a mega study, but then she focused, of course, on the first venous thrombosis. And this is a study where we had almost 5,000 patients with a first event. And the controls here were partners of the patients. So they were all of the opposite sex. And that made the analysis quite complicated because they were all matched on, on the opposite sex. But still, she managed to do this. It will take a lot of time to explain it. I will not do it, but she found that Indeed, men had twice as high risk of first venous thrombosis compared to women without reproductive risk factors. So when this is indeed confirmed by other studies, that would explain the last paradox where there is actually not so much a problem in recurrence risk, but more in, in first events. So that would mean that men may have an intrinsically higher risk of venous thrombosis, both for first as for recurrent events. The cause of this difference we do not know, obviously, 
but until we know, we can at least use male sex as a very good predictor for recurrence risk. So to summarize, because what we want, as I said, these, this ultimate goal of prevention, I think we have more or less three groups. The easy ones are the people who had a strong transient risk factor at the time of their first event, because their recurrence risk will be low. And the other group are the ones who will be exposed to a new transient risk factor. Also here, it seems quite obvious not to expose them to, to other risk factors or when this is inevitable to make sure that they receive good trauma prophylaxis. Then there is the moderately difficult group, and these are, I think, the people who are exposed to a, this a progressive risk factor that becomes worse over time. And here also, obviously, the bleeding risk needs to be taken into account, and this is probably a very individual decision. But the most difficult group, and that was also mentioned by Dr. Argeno, is the patients in whom none of the above risk factors are present. So these are the ones who have fixed risk factors, just genes, age, things we don't know, perhaps height. Their risk is, according to the meta-analysis, about 8% per year. So quite high, but still you are not sure if that warrants, if that high enough to justify lifelong anticoagulant treatment. So it would be very nice to distinguish within this group still high versus lower risk individuals. And I think it would be worthwhile to see if a very detailed risk profile could, could do that. So you've seen this slide also before. The three prediction models that are currently here are already a big step forward. And they do predict quite well, actually. And many of the variables overlap. But perhaps these models could be integrated into one model. And that could perhaps even be more extended, supplemented with more detailed information about every patient. And in that way, we could perhaps further distinguish, further refine people with higher and lower risk. And that is, is feasible, is perhaps illustrated by this slide from Astrid van Hilke and Vlieg, and she'll show this this afternoon. She looked at five SNPs who are related to risk of our first event, and she, saw, she studied whether having more or less risk alleles does distinguish people with higher and lower risk, and th this was indeed the case. So this offers hope that perhaps by using these kinds of data, more detailed information, not only genetic, but only also more environmental risk factors or blood markers, that all that information together will help in making a more detailed risk profile. So at least it needs to include sex, of course, because it's a very strong predictor. Markers of traumatogenic processes, like I just mentioned with the dimer, etc., and perhaps extensive genetic profiling and even more parameters. So my final conclusion would be that to a large extent, you can actually, I think, by using this thrombosis potential model, when you think about the individual causes of your patient, you may be able to, to decide how his or her recurrence risk is, if it, if it will go down, if it will go up, if it will go, stay the same, more or less. So it could help, perhaps, to some extent in deciding whether or not patients should be continued treatment. But the difficult group that remains is this high-risk group of patients who had an unprovoked first event. And here we would really welcome a detailed prediction model. And I would like to finish with acknowledging everyone who worked on the MEGA study and who funded this study. And thank you for your attention.